So if you are a, an aficionado of modern weightlifting or even historical weightlifting, we'll often see weightlifters who are incredibly jacked at like phenomenally low levels of body fat, muscle definition that would make a pro horse, pro horse racing horse, put them to shame. Uh, with people like Liu Zhaojun, a lot of the Chinese team are notorious for being phenomenally jacked, uh, in great condition, doing a huge amount of variance of bodybuilding exercises in their training. We often have the Russians as well, for example, Klockoff would have been very, very famous and part of his rise to fame would have been his just outrageous physique. Uh, he also, he did a bodybuilding competition while he was still in very, very good weightlifting shape. Now, these are somewhat outliers, but we do see these elite weightlifters in incredible shape. And we have to ask the question, is this relevant to the amateur weightlifter? Is this relevant to the everyday amateur weightlifter who is not a professional athlete lifting in the sport of weightlifting? So I know you're probably watching this video and you're thinking, well, the Bulgarians were one of the most successful international weightlifting teams ever. They did zero bodybuilding. The Armenian team, incredibly successful. The Iranian team, incredibly successful. Very, very small amounts or low amounts of bodybuilding, if any, were done by any of these teams. There is an elephant in the room here, though. So most of these teams had unfettered access and use of performance enhancing drugs. These drugs allow people to maintain positions, to achieve progression levels and slopes of their progression that are just simply unattainable for, for anyone else without that unfettered use. Even people who are enhanced aren't going to be able to push quite so hard if they're being tested. So most modern weightlifters don't have that access and can't push that train quite so hard. If you're watching this video and you're thinking, oh, well, I want to train like the great Bulgarians of the past and I'm not enhanced or not doping, you really do need to be focusing more on your bodybuilding work, your accessory work and that general hypertrophy work in order to keep pushing your weights up. So for our modern weightlifter, we're really looking for a nice kind of hybrid balance between the extreme end of the Chinese weightlifting and then the extreme end of the Bulgarians taking as much performance enhancing drugs as possible. So we want that kind of aspiration for our lower ped use body weightlifters or, or even natural and amateur bodybuilders, which is the real focus of this video, is that you want to be looking for a leanest, most muscular physique you can maintain while being in a healthy state in terms of caloric balance. And you want to maximize your muscle tissue in training because those teams prior who for example like the bulgarians would have been able to kind of circumnavigate some of those kind of typical physiological stuff we'd see with natural weightlifters uh, they would maximize the amount of fast stitch fibers they'd have for a gram of muscle mass and their kind of cns and related contractile values whereas for our amateur and our natural weightlifters we really want to see is someone who has as much muscle mass as they can maintain while keeping their mobility in check and doing their ability to maintain those positions they want this is because you need to maximize as much of your body weight in your weight class as possible into weightlifting. So you want to be able to maintain a body composition that allows you to still be healthy, but also uh, really take advantage of your weight and not waste it on, for example, body fat or, you know, other potential areas. The other benefits then, of course, of the bodybuilding or this kind of uh, higher variation training that's non-specific to snatch and clean and jerk for variants is that we want to make sure we're keeping joint integrity, uh, rehab and prehab going, uh, heading off injuries or restoring function from previous injuries. So a lot of these bodybuilding exercises have a variety of different uses for the amateur weightlifter. And we would really encourage you to take a look at your physique and take a look at your training variation and see if you can incorporate some of these into your training and see if these can help not only your technique, uh, but not your power to weight ratio and your potential for injury or return from injury. So with all that being said, these are our top five bodybuilding exercises for weightlifters. Up first, and probably in order in this case, our back extensions. So the back is one of the most commonly injured areas for weightlifters. It's commonly the place where we'll get achy, tired, tight, sore. If you're just getting back into training or if you've had a brief period of, of pushing the weights a small bit heavier the back will be one of the first areas where you'll get those aches and pains back extensions in this case prone on the ground just doing body weight holds are a great great way to build some extra capacity in those kind of hip extensors and in the the spinal erectors 
and allow you to be able to maintain positions a small bit better while snatching, clean and jerking, squatting and pulling, but also allow you to put more power into the bar at the very top of your extension. So a really useful part of um, back extensions or prone back extensions is oftentimes we'll have weightlifters will have a extreme lack of awareness of where their back is relative to the rest of their body and in what position their back is in their different segments so their mid upper and lower back might be incredibly disjointed with each other and where you think they're relative to space so this prone back extensions or any kind of back extensions really allow our weightlifters to develop some proprioception with their back especially when we add things like back extension holds or we go for slow eccentric reps we really learn where our back is how to contract our back and then hopefully make that second nature with the use of back extensions. If our backs were the first most common area to get sore, certainly for weightlifters, the knees tend to be the next most common area of pain or common issue area. Quad Nordics are one of the best ways to load the quadriceps tendon and the patellar tendon. So a lot of times when we get knee discomfort or knee pain while weightlifting, it's the development of some sort of tendon issue. It may not be tendonitis, it may not be tendinopathy, but it's some sort of aggravation of the tendons. The two tendons that affect our knee are, of course, our quadriceps tendon, or knee extension, is our quadriceps tendon and our patellar tendon. And the real issue with tendons is we don't get a lot of tendon loading unless we're either, either in a very heavy isometric hold, we're doing some sort of heavy eccentric hold, or if we're doing some sort of ballistic or stretch shortening cycle uh, training. The Quad Nordics allow us to do a really strong eccentric and isometric piece, it allows us to really target that, that tendon unit itself, and it allows us not only to, to fix an issue that might be happening currently, but also allows us to kind of future-proof our knees and make them a small bit more bulletproof towards further squat volume or squirter volume with the lifts. So another use of quad nordics is despite the use of full extension a or near full extension the snatch and the clean we actually spend a lot of time in shortened hip flexor positions so in the start position and the bottom position of the snatch we are in the clean as well we spend a lot of time with our hip flexor shortened and we find oftentimes the weightlifters especially amateur weightlifters or non-pro weightlifters will spend a lot of time at the desk or driving will also exacerbate this kind of shortened hip flexor position and so it's very very useful and a lot of times we'll see a helping or additional helping for knee pain is when they elongate these hip flexors as much as possible and these respond quite well to this body weight load and this pinned down knee position that allows us to really extend those hip flexors all the way up into the hip flexor attachment point up near the top and extend our psoas as much as possible as well to kind of release some of this tension we see and allow the hip flexors to learn what an elongated position is as the amount of workload going into the short position is very very common and quite high compared to the time we spend in full extension. So the next very valuable piece of bodybuilding for our weightlifters is the use of barbell rows. So we're not particularly bothered where you do these barbell rows from. Are they from the floor, from the hang, or slightly above the knee? These are all totally fine as long as you're doing some kind of barbell row. Now we mentioned in a previous video, people are saying, why would you not want uh, external rotation or elbows flaring in the barbell row? Are we not looking to target our rear delts, for example? What you really want to be to focusing on in weightlifting is, first of all, training the biggest muscle in your upper body, which is your lats. They cover a huge area of your back and your sides also involved in this is our external rotators which are our lats again so we really want to be training these as much as possible in weightlifting external rotation is very very useful but we also spend a lot of time in internal rotation when pulling the barbell so we want to make sure that we are getting some semblance of a balance now you don't need like a one-to-one -one ratio or anything cr kind of strange like that you don't need to be putting numbers on it as long as you're training your external rotators and you're training your positional strength for the snatch and the clean and jerk with the barbell rows, you're getting a lot of the benefits from this. A lot of times we'll see is weightlifters will focus on their squats or their front squats as much as possible. And a lot of times you can ask an amateur weightlifter or even a pro weightlifter be like, what's your max deadlift? And they will have no idea. It'll take them several seconds of thinking and they'll say, I think I did 180 a few years ago when I used to do powerlifting and not weightlifting. So you really wanna make sure you're training your back in a good and directed manner and not leaving it up to pulls and our squats. So oftentimes our pulls, can be kind of disjointed and focus a lot on our leg extension strength and weightlifters can get away from really using their back sufficiently in pulls if they're not doing them correctly. I think the other major advantage of a barbell row is that oftentimes we ask someone to kind of build their mid back or build their, their upper back, they'll start looking at things like pull-ups or wide grip pull-ups and those things really aren't where you want a weightlifter to go. So the last thing you want a weightlifter to do is focus on 
internally rotating they'll lose that front rack position if their lats get very tight they'll lose some of the overhead position that they'll need for the jerk or the snatch the barbell row allows us to have a bit more control over that it allows us to control the plane of the movements like Garth was talking about for me one thing I really like weightlifters do particularly with the slightly lighter weight classes or with the uh, lower age groups or female weightlifters a lot of the time the bar will drift away from them from the floor because their upper back is quite weak in those cases when they're doing the bent over row i like them to pull the barbell back into their hip crease so rather than being in the very inclined over position where they're pulling the bar straight up to the bottom of the rib cage or to the nipple level i prefer them to be rowing the barbell up and backwards into the hip crease and that will target the lats even more and just allow you to keep that elbow pulling back the whole time so next up in our list we have split squats so we've got kind of two variations of split squats that we are pretty happy for people to do we have that very forward quad driven split squat where your knee goes as far over as your toe as possible trademark not pending uh, or then we have the opposite where we have this very vertical drop down with the rear knee so you essentially have one or the other limbs working in opposition we are quite big fans of the elevated position as well just slightly elevated doesn't need to be anything crazy but it does allow you to kind of maximize that forward knee drive uh, in weightlifting, you know, we do a lot of bipedal movements and we use both our limbs quite aggressively. And oftentimes we don't get as much or as much as we could be doing of single leg work. Now, you'll never get symmetry in your body no matter how much you train it. And it's not something you should obsess over, but it is still important to address it. You don't want to let things get massively out of whack. For example, sometimes you might go to a physio or a chiropractor or someone like that, or you'll see they might put you up on electronic scales and look at how much of your weight is distributed across the two scales. Now, this is just a minor test they'll do to have a look at things, but it does give you some semblance of their thought process behind how much load is taken from one leg to the other. A lot of times you'll see people with slightly bigger leg from one side to the other will have discrepancies in mobility or will have a little bit of a hip shift in their squats. And if these things get really out of whack, they can contribute to injuries or it can be a sign of future injury. So these split squats are kind of future proofing us against those or rehabbing us from previous egregious injuries. There is a study done by the EWF as well, uh, looking at the leg that goes forward in the split jerk versus the leg that goes backwards in the split jerk. And it was common across that study. They looked at loads of European weightlifters and they found a 30% increase in uh, cross-sectional area of the quadricep on the front leg than on the back leg. So it's clear that people are being skewed in a certain direction if they're just doing the weightlifting movements. And the split squat's a great way of kind of balancing those things out as Gurf is talking about. The final movement then, and one of our personal favorites for weightlifters is the strict press. People have an obsession over saying, oh, I jerked 150 kilos and my strict press was 50 kilos, or I jerked 200 kilos and my strict press was 70 kilos. That's nothing to boast about. It's certainly nothing to pay any attention to if you're kind of writing your own programs or trying to learn more about training. Certainly don't pay any attention to elite level weightlifters who say that. A stronger strict press will allow you to have a stronger push press, which will allow you to have a stronger jerk, will allow you to have a better lockout in the snatch, a better lockout in the jerk. So it really is something all weightlifters should be focusing on. It should be in your program basically year round, and you should always just have the aim of gradually kind of creeping that number up over time. It's not really something you'd pick and say, I'm gonna strict press really hard for eight weeks now and I won't have to do it for a long time. You really do just have to be pressing the bar constantly once or twice a week and trying to get that number to increase so i've never seen a modern amateur natural weightlifter miss a lift because their strict press is too high so it's something that's very very beneficial one area we really see this shining is female weightlifters across all levels amateur natural any combination of the pro and natural amateur natural whatever way you want these venn diagrams intersect is all very very useful especially for late teen or early teen weightlifters the strict pressing the stability you get from strict pressing is incredibly beneficial this even transfers over to their clean especially their jerk and the overhead and their snatch the strict press from front or behind the neck is very very useful for those we see that stability build up a lot uh, you see it then shining as well in men who are jerking kind of north or getting close to double body weight having a higher strict press can really additionally help their ability to lock out and finish the last part strong and maintain those positions again like fit said you don't need to be smashing the weights to incredibly high numbers typically what we see is the act of pressing any amount at moderate weights does the job very, very well. So you don't need to kill yourself for a new one or strict press, but slowly try and push those numbers up over the years as your other numbers increase. 
If you're looking for weightlifting programming, go to the link below. It'll bring you to both our beginner weightlifting program and our standard weightlifting programs. Our standard weightlifting programs run in continuous blocks. So you start off at block one, then you go through two, three, four, five, six, seven. There is loads and loads of blocks there. So four sessions a week, four weeks per block for the standard weightlifting program. It's four sessions per week for 12 weeks for the beginner program. If you have any questions, pop them in the comments down below and we'll get back to you and we'll talk to you all again soon.